Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sophie Vance, and I am the Senior Membership Manager at NSTXL. Welcome to our second of three summer event series, the RFS Anatomy. Before we begin, I would like to go over a quick agenda slide to set the stage for the next hour. Over the next 40 minutes or so, our NSTXL panel of experts will walk you through each section of the RFS to discuss how the government customer determines what approach to take, what information the government will require, and how prospective vendors like yourself can respond. This will be an interactive session as we'll be answering your questions and we'll be asking you, yes you, polling questions, so don't be shy. And to keep things even more interesting, we will be giving away a few prizes. Next slide. And with that, let me introduce you to our NSTXL team. First, let us start with Ian Skeets and Janae Mills, our acquisition experts who will be co-hosting and presenting at today's event. We also have our experts in everything to do with T-Rex and Smarts, Tara Kilkillen and Brooke Payne, Pine. Sorry. Hannah and I are from the marketing and membership team and will be supporting the event. We'll be here to help you with your membership questions and we'll also be moderating the live questions for the NSTXL experts. Before we begin, let's review how to submit a question. Slido is the platform we'll be taking all your questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I encourage you all to join the event at slido.com now because the NSTXL experts will be asking a few polling questions during the entire presentation. This is easy to set up. Go to slido.com, enter code X. 1520 in the event code box, hit join and input your questions and answer the polls. Today we have some great giveaways. We'll be doing a random drawing for two hydro flasks and the grand prize, a Kindle white paper or paper white. <laughs> the only caveat is that at the end of the presentation, when you hear your name, please send us an email at membership at nstxl.org. We will be repeating the details at the end of the presentation. Just make sure to stay until the end when we do the random drawing and select attendees' names. The NSTXL experts will be trying to address all questions if time permits. If not, they'll be taking the questions offline. So let's get started with an icebreaker and get you guys all warmed up. <laughs> Go to slido.com and use code X1520. All right, I think the poll question is gonna go live right now. All right, so do you love working from home or would you rather be in your office? Yes, working from home is the best. I can take it or leave it. I'd rather be working at the office. And D, a mix of both would be ideal. Wow, look at that. A mix of both. I think I'm um, on board with your mix of both. Looks like we have about 60% of the people um, saying that they could do a mix. And, uh, and uh, these 32% of people are really enjoying their time at home. So anyways, with that, I appreciate all, all of you taking the time to answer the poll. And I'm going to pass it off to NSTXL Smarts Director, Brooke Pine. Thank you, Sophie. And um, I too agree with those results. I'm, I'm in the, the higher end of the 50, 60%, and I too certainly enjoy a mix of both. Um, so it's an honor to be with you all again today for the second of our summer event series. And before we dive into the RFS specifics, uh, we wanted to provide a little bit of context and a little bit of background on our innovation platform that really becomes foundational to who we are at NSTXL, but then also foundational to T-Rex and SMARTS and how we function um, and how we enable that innovation ecosystem. 
So I'm not going to cover um, each one of these bullet points on this on this slide in detail, but I do want to draw attention to a couple of those. The first one being the open source network model. So this becomes a really unique way for us to communicate with um, the government ready community that really becomes a part of this innovation platform. And the open source model allows for open awareness on any and all opportunities that that are functioning underneath both T-Rex and also the SMARTS OTA vehicles. So that allows for a lot of cross pollination between the two communities. We have a lot of similar technology areas um, and it also allows for a broader outreach that is very supportive to our government customer. So it's kind of a win win all the way around. So we really, really like that open source uh, network model. And because of that, technology and location really doesn't matter. You know, a lot of cross pollination where you're located. You don't have to be located in southern Indiana where I'm at, although it is a great place to be located um, to actually be engaged in smarts. We are certainly across the US and then even global in some instances on those opportunities. Um, another thing that we do um, is mentoring a lot of non traditionals. So, the OTA environment is all about engagement with the non-traditional defense community, and we are also a, a non-traditional. So being able to build what we have built at NSTXL and kind of understand what the other non-traditionals are going, going through and what they need to be aware of to be able to be in that government-ready community state and to be able to function with a government customer really becomes key. Um, and that mentorship that we provide um, is really second to none at this point. Um, and I really enjoy those type of interactions with the, that community. The other thing that's really unique about the platform um, that we create is, is it's all about teaming, facilitating the teaming aspect within the OTA environment. And that really comes a part of how can we encompass and, and kind of embed the team members to actually provide a full, well-rounded solution set back to our government customers. So there's a large part of teaming dialogue and teaming interaction uh, that we do on the platform as well. Next slide, please. So just diving into this a little bit deeper in this ecosystem, um, it is fueled by 600 plus members. And again, that NSTXL innovation platform is all members, regardless of which um, OTA that you might have been interested in when you joined in to the to the to the community. Um, again, a lot of cross pollination and a lot of things that you can do across both OTAs. So so that broader platform um, is really unique, and it fosters a collaborative environment that really creates intentional and focused outreach. Again, the the extensive teaming and partnering aspect. Um, and it's really driven to, to get to that true government ready community, which then has some very impactful results. Um, some of those include high quality solutions and teaming arrangements back to the federal government, uh, community growth and critical key technology areas that our government customers are driving towards. But then also it kind of drives some strategic technical dialogue. Um, that also helps with technical direction, strategic direction, and trending. So again, T-Rex and SMARTS becomes the enabling components and vehicles that allow for this innovation platform to function as a whole. So with that context set, I'm actually going to turn it over to Ms. Janae, who's going to dive in deep to the um, RFS uh, questions and slide deck. Janae? Yeah. Thank you, Brooke. As Brooke said, I'm Janae Mills. I'm the NST, NSTXL Acquisition Manager for the Smarts Vehicle out of NSWC Crane. So let's get started here with our first, first polling question. It looks like this is going to be true or false, so get ready here. The purpose of other transactions is speed. Is that A, true, everything else is secondary, B, false, or C, I have no idea how long the process takes. All right, it looks like we're coming in. We're pulling in at about 70% on false. Okay, it looks like you all are getting it. The answer here is false. Good job. 
Excellent. And thank you, Ms. Mills. You, you are spot on. The answer is false. Um, when, when discussing other transactions, I always like to dispel this myth as early as possible, even before I introduce myself. It's that important to me. So if you ever hear anyone brief that the primary purpose of another transaction is speed, walk out, well, excuse me, virtually walk out, go to the virtual ticket booth and request a virtual refund. Uh, speed is a byproduct of an efficient process that focuses on common sense business practices, the early involvement of industry experts of all types and sizes, and my personal favorite, transparent collaboration that goes both ways. So unlike FAR-based contracting, the intent of another transaction agreement is not to address every what-if scenario in advance or try to lower the risk to absolutely zero for the customer. Instead, the OT process should focus on the government only requesting what is absolutely required and designing a structure that can intelligently adapt to mission need. Because the entire contracting process is tailored, or should be tailored, the likelihood of speed substantially increases. So less wasted movement and more deliberate intent with tailored planning. So for those of you I have not met before, my name is Ian Skeet, and I serve as the principal of acquisition here at NSTXL. Uh, prior to joining NSTXL, I was supporting Army Contracting Command out of Orlando for just over 10 years, where in my final few years, I was a, a supervisory contracting and agreements officer. I have been very fortunate to be involved in contributing to other transaction policy um, at the Army level, the Navy level, um, and also DOD-wide. Um, I'm fortunate enough to write a lot on the topic. I get to speak a lot about the topic. And, and most importantly, and especially for, the, for this audience, I've taken my fair share of bumps and bruises along the way. Um, so I'm coming from a place of legitimate experience working in this domain, and I'm always happy to share any insights I can to further our broader ecosystem. So again, it's uh, great to see you all today. Some of you did leave your cameras on, so I'm only kidding. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So I'd like to start by going through some of the basic elements of the RFS and, and why they matter, why you should read them. Now, the request for solutions is the traditional title of the solicitations released under the NSTXL platform. Uh, that terminology was born under the T-Rex vehicle and has since spread to our other contracts and also other commands and organizations are starting to use that term as well. What I often find startling is when I feel these calls at the 11th hour, you know, right before the proposal is due, and a very calm voice on the other end of the phone is asking you, you know, where can I find the technical objectives? <laughs> this is a real thing that happens, folks. Uh, you don't want to wait to the last minute. Or, or imagine the very unconventional professor who will not stop sending the same recycled cyber white paper in rather than following the instructions that the government has decided were important. And then he can't understand why he wasn't selected. So today we'll be walking through those elements and again, explaining why each element matters. So for background or purpose, um, some feel this is where you can go to find the acronym fully spelled out and uh, you can identify the program office supporting the project. Well, <laughs> that's not wrong, um, but this section of the RFS, yes, this part that you often speed through, this section of the RFS is really what anchors the story. You'll hear me refer to the story a few times today, um, and we'll dive in a little bit deeper, but this is truly where you start to understand uh, where this project is originating from. And I don't necessarily mean location, I'm referring to need. To be successful, every one of these prototype projects must wrap around an end user's story. And that user's experience should be a paramount focus when you're developing your response, your proposal. So this section gives us the backstory, explains what is used now to meet mission, and then starts to expose the optimal end state for that project. So I'd like to take that a little bit further beyond just focusing on the end state in terms of technical capabilities. Ian, we can read, the RFS says they want to move supplies at Mach 5 and it has to be controlled by an iPhone. Boom, got it. Well, please hear me out. <laughs> Ensure you understand how the government actually wants the end result delivered. Sounds easy, right? Well, you'd be surprised. Oftentimes, folks might think that the government is seeking a full blown out, built out prototype that they can pull levers and, and push buttons and they have a tiny budget to go along with it. Well, read closer. They might only be seeking a study. So again, the RFS will clearly tell you the desired end state. Is it a report? Is it a demonstration? Do we need to push those buttons and pull levers? There are obvious implications to your approach if you don't understand how they actually want to receive that end product. And you certainly don't want to spin your company's wheels and expend unnecessary investment simply because you did not understand this area or ask a follow-up question. Um, I have a feeling your price proposal for a demo-ready build-out would look a little bit different than a price proposal for a study. So please pay attention to that area. 
And don't forget, um, if you do have to deliver a tangible prototype that requires shipping, please factor that price into your proposal. <laughs> we don't want to get to the final milestone and then have everyone arguing about who is paying for the stamps. So for the next two bullets, I'll address those together. And those are related to project structure and potential off-ramps. I got it, this is a pretty straightforward concept. However, it really does deserve a little bit more attention than most are probably used to giving it. Uh, yes, phases and options are important because you want to know what will be funded at the award and what might get funded later. And again, that, that's not wrong. However, a main reason you should assess how the project is structured is because this will be one of your first looks behind the customer's curtain. In other words, the structure of a project has a direct correlation to the level of confidence the government may have, the government may have in an emerging technology, as well as their level of risk tolerance. You'll notice that more risky projects tend to be designed with more built-in control mechanisms for the government. And these mechanisms are reflected either through optional tasks or optional line items that tend to build upon the preceding capability. These indicators within an RFS should play a huge part in your company's go, no go decision. You know, are they funding the entire effort up front on one line item and they'll see you in a year? Or are you having to put together design reviews every 30 days that will determine your next allotment of funding? You have to consider these areas and do not hesitate to explain a structure's impact on your company. So if you see a project that is publicized and the structure does not make sense, whether it's for your company or for the entire domain of providers, make sure that feedback reaches the government. Because I, I could guarantee you that if you're curious about that, there are other companies wondering the same as well. So with regard to partial solutions, I'll say this right up front. If the RFS does not have any language to relay that partial solutions are permitted, you have a couple of choices. Um, option A, ask the question and get confirmation. Option B, just propose against the entire effort, whether you're ready or not. Or option C, roll the dice and see what they'll accept. Obviously, this, the safest, le less risky option is to ask the question and get confirmation. This element of the RFS serves to forecast the customer's plans for that particular prototype project. Again, this plays right into your firm's go, no-go decision. Do we pursue or not? Use this information to influence multiple elements of your strategy and your decision. So as an example, what if the government intends to possibly award to several companies, each providing a piece of the whole solution? All right, well, who's on the hook for integration? Does that matter? Um, do you need to ensure that certain software hooks are available for a certain platform? Are they agnostic? Do you need to latch into a legacy system? I mean, these are huge considerations and sometimes costly considerations. And of course, if partial solutions are not preferred and you can only contribute a piece of the need with your niche technology, then get your elevator pitch ready, head to NSTXL community and find a teaming partner. Um, it's always great when we see these dynamic teams built um, truly the experts in each domain and see them play off each other and collaborate to again further that prototype's chance of success. So with that, uh, Janae, I'll turn it over to you, ma'am, for some takeaways. As Ian just said here, once that RFS has posted and, and you have taken a chance to re read through it, please ask yourself two key questions here. Can you clearly understand the user's perspective? And is the success criteria clear? If not, Take the opportunity during that open Q&A period to ask any questions you may have. And if that project is supported by a project talk series, that's another opportunity there to engage the gov government in order to get your questions answered and develop a plausible and competitive solution um, to present to the government. Um, and as early as the coming soon notices, start engaging the NSTXL community and look at opportunities to team with other members of the NSTXL network. Next slide. Thank you, Janae. So moving on to the desired level of data rights and you know we'll cover IP as well. We all know very well that a discussion on data rights and IP could take multiple webinars. Um, quite frankly, I've been to numerous data rights and IP trainings, and I still don't think I've reached the end of the material. So I'll keep it short. You know, here, Here's the bottom line from where I sit. And of course, the views expressed today belong to Ian Skeet alone. They're not of those of NSTXL of the United States government. But here's, here's Ian's perspective. 
Don't mortgage your company's future because you are too excited to win the instant award. So what do I mean by that? Protect your IP and make sure your company is looking ahead. Again, you've invested a lot in building that firm, building your IP, uh, obviously building that reputation, building your staff. Um, you polish this niche, make sure you protect it. Now, that being said, do everything possible within reason, everything possible within reason to support the mission and the warfighter or whoever that end user may be. Um, don't withhold too much just because you think you can off the bat. Um, not saying you're prohibited from doing that, but it's just not a wise decision to withhold too much without rationale. Again, this is something that you'll decide in your conference room, but make sure there's a balance there. Um, do everything in your power to meet the government's desired level of rights and also protect your firm. So if you have a concern or a question related to data rights, my advice always is to investigate as much as needed to figure out why, why the government has requested a certain level of rights. Um, quite frankly, maybe they don't really care and uh, government purpose rights just briefs really well. You don't get a lot of questions when you say we're gonna ask for GPR. Uh, maybe it's a copy and paste from a previous project. Maybe the products that you're creating under this effort will be used to support a recompete that you can't bid on. So for you risk takers out there, I mean, this is not an area to play around. Um, this is a critical area where all parties need to look out for each other, be transparent, and have a complete understanding of what is being asked and offered. Again, um, if anything, this will spur a great conversation about the government's long-term view, the technology roadmap, and where they see that technology in you know, three, five, 10 years, whatever the case may be. Ask the question and have a good understanding. Remember, these should be negotiated and customized anytime where necessary. Um, eight and a half out of 10 agreements officers, they're, they're gonna rely on the DFARS. So absolutely be familiar with the references. There's nothing wrong with that. If it works, you know, don't worry about it. Keep, keep it moving, but you can negotiate and customize those terms. It does not have to be the direct language from the DFARS. So be familiar with those references. Um, that, that's your duty as someone who's proposing against a project to support the US government. Be familiar with those references, but also be prepared to support why you want the rights tailored a certain way. Please include that explanation. Uh, all too often we see um, proposals come in where they don't explain why they do not want to provide the level of rights requested by the government, uh, which obviously can create a pretty um, sticky situation. Moving forward to security considerations, um, again, on the surface, a very straightforward topic, but I want to dig into this a little bit further. If there are certain restrictions that are being levied on a project, please take comfort in knowing that there is a reason. Um, the security considerations are, are huge, um, both for NSTXL when we're supporting the government, but also for that government customer. So there is a reason for why those security considerations are there. That's not something that's um, put into a project or an RFS lightly. Um, a primary goal of your firm while reviewing this element should be the when. When do you have to be compliant? As an example, the RFS states that a top secret clearance is a requirement. Okay, cool, that's clear. But when must your clearance be active? Can the TS be pending while phase one is completed? Does it apply to your key management personnel at award or not until you start testing in phase three? Is it a facility level clearance? Is it possessing, non -possess all of these different factors you should ask and figure out and find out why. This, um, unfortunately, this is an area that often um, a lot of the non-traditionals and smalls, they see there's a requirement for, whether it's ITARs, um, the, the TS, whatever the case may be, they see that requirement and automatically take themselves out of the competition because they're not there yet or it's pending or they're not sure when they'll be ready to have a fully um, auditable cyber system. Ask the questions, please. And trust me, I, I fully understand the right, excuse me, the art of writing a proposal. Um, that being said, this is an area where your response, you know, what you're certifying as true and factual carries a tremendous amount of weight and consequence. So ask the questions now so you can give the right answers later. Excellent. So moving right into budget. This is always an important one. Um, and, you know, a project's respective budget really helps to highlight the 80% of the iceberg that you can't immediately see. Federal budgets always change. I get that, just hear me out. Advertised budgets really do help highlight the DOD's level of commitment and expectations for that effort. Expectations in terms of growth, scaling, potential production, you name it. 
Um, while it's not a set formula, we all know that the higher uh, dollar projects, you tend to have more visibility on them. And there's a lot more pressure on the government to hit certain internal uh, metrics, whether it's obligations, disbursements, et cetera, and also the most important thing, delivery. So if the RFS includes language, any sort of language that says something along, along the lines of, our budget is X, but please provide a ROM for the other features that you may think are beneficial. Please take full advantage of that opportunity. Um, this is um, a, a shift in culture I've seen as of late, oh, within the past year or so, where the, the government customer is being a bit more open about their budget. Um, the initial concern was, well, everyone's just gonna propose to whatever dollar amount we put out there. And that may be correct, but you know what? Now you can focus on the technology. We know you're probably gonna spend all that money anyway by the end of the year. Focus on the technology. Now you can see how much you can get, how far you can spread that dollar to meet those tech objectives, to meet mission. So again, as someone who is responding to a proposal, respect that budget. The government is being very forthright with you in terms of what they have now to put on an award, but be honest about where the, the project could go. The customer may not be aware of what's really possible. So show them and make it very clear in your proposal. Hey, for the $2 million you advertise, I can do this and hit these objectives. In the future, here are some of the options or features we could possibly add. Um, and you know, give a ROM or estimate cost. You won't be locked into it, of course. Um, but it's important that everyone sees just how far um, the, the project could progress. And who knows, um, projects that do show progress and promise tend to be the recipients of year-end sweep-up money. So having a framework of ideas in advance certainly can't hurt. All right, so deadlines. <laughs> everyone, please uh, check for the time, the date, and the time zone. I won't say always, um, because you know we've had a long talk today about making assumptions, but for the most part, it can be assumed that it's Eastern time zone. Um, still confirm. Make sure you have a full understanding of when it's due and how to submit it. And we'll go through that later on. But on days where proposals are anticipated, it's all hands on deck for NSTXO. Um, and I say this just to give some, some insight into what we go through on those proposal days, because um, there's a lot that happens. Um, we have backup plans for backup plans, and uh, we stay in comms with the respective government contract team providing updates um, if there are any issues. We're gonna maintain real-time awareness of any uptime issues, downtime issues, network errors, et cetera, as it relates to our secure portal. So please reach out to our team if there's any issues on deadline day submitting your proposal. We literally are standing by all hands on deck, ready to help to ensure that your submission is timely. But please make sure that um, you don't wait till the final second to hit submit. <laughs> Janae, do you mind going through a couple of those takeaways for us? Oh, absolutely, Ian. You have made some key points there. The one that I want to definitely point out here is respecting the budget. Although the government has posted uh, a tentative budget there for their solutions, please, please, if your organization has a diff additional capability, put it out there. Illustrate that capability and potential cost too. Um, as soon as we release coming soon, soon notices, utilize that submit your questions box to uh, present any questions you may have. We start tallying those in and pushing them out to the government team on some of our vehicles. As soon as we receive them, they go over to the government. On others, we wait until the close of the Q&A period here. And of course, if you have any security issues, any uh, questions or concern, please reach out to security at nstxl.org. Um, to, to start addressing those issues or concern. We do not want you to be excluded from any opportunities just because you're uncertain about security issues. Next slide. Let's move on to our next polling question here. Let's see, we have, do subcontractors have to be members of the NSTXL network? That's a great question. A, yes, they do. B, it depends on the situation. C, no, they don't. Or D, I am not sure. All right, it looks like we're polling in at about 80%. I know they don't. And for those of you who answered C, no, they don't, you are correct. 
Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next slide now. Thank you, Janine. So earlier I climbed up on my, my soapbox and I talked about understanding the story. Um, I often scream this from the rooftops, drives my neighbors nuts, but it's so important. Um, we wanted to take a few extra moments just to dissect you know, an actual example, especially for those of you on the call who may not have previously reviewed an RFS. So if, if written properly, you shouldn't have to have an engineering or a physics degree or have 30 plus years of DOD contracting experience to figure out the basics of what the government is seeking, the problem they're trying to solve. This information tends to be located within the first few sections of the RFS. Most of you fly through just so you can get to the deadline first. Definitely have to look here to set the stage for your response. The problem should be clear. Um, in this example, the customer is using words like replace and obsolete in support of state-of-the-art designs. So these are key words you need to hone in on as you develop your own theme within your proposal. You need to imagine that user that's attempting to solve his personal problems on a day-to-day -day basis, his tasks using these obsolete tools, these old practices as the commercial market speeds by. So can the user meet mission and how? Well, we gotta dig deeper. What is their current capability? How are they meeting mission now? As you can see from that statement, the government customer is saying, commercial industry, please help us out. We are, they are significantly superseding the DOD. That says a lot. So this is often a, um, a, a great indicator for those firms who are you know, either primarily commercial-based firms or non-traditionals who have a different approach um, to certain technologies. This is where the government is saying, we wanna see what's out there. What is state of the art? Um, so this is, a, a, again, a, a wonderful way to dissect the intent of the project. And of course, what capability does the user want to end up with? What is the end goal? I mean, here you may find some technical parameters laid out, some specifications, et cetera, but here is where the vision often lives. Now, there may be several steps and maybe years of performance before that end goal is actually reached, but it is the respondent's job to make sure that your plan is logical. No, I didn't say easy. <laughs> make sure your plan is laid out in a logical fashion and you can explain how you're going to get from the kickoff conference all the way through delivering to the warfighter. Now you're gonna have a lot of smart folks reviewing your proposal, but one of the best ways to reduce risk to your firm and of course increase the likelihood of receiving an award is to reduce or eliminate the number of assumptions an evaluator will have to make. Um, and guys, that goes for OTAs, far based contracts, negotiating with your landscaping company, I don't care. Do your best to reduce or eliminate the number of assumptions that the evaluator will have to make ensure you have a clear, logical process laid out. Next slide, please. Again, of course, the contracts guy wants to talk about structure. Well, <laughs> it's important, and this is certainly another area that deserves additional attention. Um, I did cover this at a high level earlier, but it's absolutely worth diving into a little bit deeper. Um, and that is not a real picture of a customer or a member, just as a heads up, it's only clip art. So keep in mind the spirit of OTAs and their purpose. All parties will benefit from an agreement structure that is influenced by a long-term vision and a well-informed customer. You know, I, the, the question I get a lot is, well, what's stopping the government from modifying our project in the future and adding those features later? Well, you know, I, I can't say. And to me, the fact that we can't definitively say that, yes, you will, you can mod this contract later on to add features, to me, that's a risk that should be addressed earlier on, or at least a topic that should be addressed early on. Some agreements officers will be more fluid in their interpretation, whereas some may only adjust that, that contract, that agreement, um, will only adjust it in certain very specific areas. Personally, I, I don't believe in um, allowing that risk to hang out there based on um, personnel turnover, um, again, different personalities being brought into the team, et cetera. Put in the extra effort now for planning and conversation with the customer. That does not necessarily need to equate to adding a lot of time to the schedule at all. In fact, this will eventually save a lot of resources as the effort proceeds. And most importantly, I feel that this helps facilitate delivery of the most relevant technology to the field, delivering at the speed of mission. 
So again, take the time to understand the structure and try to get a grasp of the customer's vision, where they could possibly see this going. And if they haven't covered everything within that realm of possibility, for lack of a better term, then bring that up. This feedback process needs to go both ways. Um, that's one area where I do see some of the momentum die off at times. It's that the, the folks who are interested in the requirement are more in a wait and see mode. They'll toss a question over the fence without providing a whole lot of substance behind it or giving the why. Please be transparent with the project owner. And I'm telling you, we're gonna do everything in our power. And I know the government team will as well to be as transparent in their response. So again, try to influence the customer strategy. Um, don't just say, hey, buy my product and my product alone, but ensure they are aware of the you know, latest trends in that particular community, et cetera. Because um, there are things that, you know, not everybody can see all aspects of a domain. So switching gears a little bit, um, for the next part of our webinar, we're going to highlight some differences uh, between two of the efforts that we manage, SMARTS and T-REX. Um, as a reminder, you know, as, as we stated earlier, once you are a part of the NSTXL network, you have the ability to propose against and be involved with and attend events for any of the OTs that we manage. Um, it's, a great, it's a great benefit of being a network member. Um, so the next couple of slides are not intended to be all inclusive, but we did want to take a moment just to ensure that you were tracking some of the nuances that each vehicle may bring to the table. So at this time, it is my privilege to turn it back over to my friend, colleague, DOD legend, and now private sector phenom, Ms. Brooke Pine. Thank you for that, Ian. And Ian and Janae, what fantastic information and dialogue that you guys have shared just in the first few slides. Um, extremely beneficial to all parties. And it is just great, great information for the folks, folks within our membership and our government ready community that, that we are building. With that said, I really appreciate the opportunity to share a couple of components that are smart centric. Um, now with that said, everything that's kind of been discussed um, to, so far through this discussion is very foundational to both OTAs and is very critical to our process. Um, you know, a couple of things to, that, that I just want to pull the thread on before I dive into these highlights is engage, engage and engage. Um, we provide you opportunities via Q&A, project talks and the community environment. This collaborative environment really is unique to that innovation platform and really unique to the OTA environment. And um, it really helps our members and helps um, the submitters understand what needs to happen in those RFSs and then, and then provide a well-rounded submission to the government. Read the instructions, reread the instructions, and reread the instructions throughout your submission drafting process. Again, revisit it, look at it frequently, um, and as always, uh, reach out if you have any questions to our team. So let's dive in pretty quickly to, again, some of these smart centric um, items that we have. So one of the items that I wanted to talk about is a proposal um, repository. So this really becomes a proposal library, proposal hopper, um, you can kind of state where um, through the evaluation process, there are proposals that, that may be due to government funding that they can't fund everything that they might want to fund that they receive on a specific RFS, especially when this is about providing a broad look of solution sets back to the federal government to a problem statement that they have. So because of that, we have a proposal repository for up to 36 months. Any federal government customer can actually come in and review what we have in that repository um, and actually pick a proposal out, an aspect of a proposal out uh, once funding becomes available and fund that without the need to recompete that. So that is actually uh, something that our customers are very, very interested in. That proposal library, uh, SMARTS has now been um, in place for a little over a year and that repository builds and builds and builds. And we certainly have people that are now coming back frequently, re-looking at what is there um, as funding becomes available or as a new need or requirement becomes apparent to them, a new threat has become, you know, was determined that that now has criticality to it. So they will go back and look at proposals for that kind of thing. So that is a that is a, a specific smarts highlight that we have. 
also the um, next bullet, the, the statement of work, which is called a TDD, a task description document. Uh, and the milestone schedule are proposed by the solution provider. So the potential performer. So the folks in our network that are providing that solution set really drive what that workload is going to look like and what that milestone schedule looks like. Now, granted, there could be some follow-up dialogue and that open collaborative follow-up discussion, uh, which is also key with, with the government customer to drive it to a certain point right before performance. But that is a key highlight um, of, of the SMARTS as well. So again, think about what you're providing, think about your milestone structure. And as Ian said, know the story. The story really becomes key to ensure that when you draft this and you're thinking through that milestone schedule, that you are marching towards exactly what that story is for that, for that government customer. The other thing that's a little unique to, to SMARTS is um, some uh, broad right authority. So what that means is that the SMARTS vehicle and the owners at NSWC Crane here in Southern Indiana has agreed to and authorized for other uh, warfare centers to have right authority on this vehicle. So what's that mean? That means that other AOs can actually come in and draft and sign off on orders against the SMARTS vehicle. So that is that really gets to the philosophy of, of, of this OTA infrastructure and really building it outward for, for not just the Navy, but also the DOD to have infrastructure to do some rapid acquisition prototyping work. Um, and this helps broaden that and it gives access to other people within that framework to be able to utilize it with their own assets um, to get to a much uh, stronger, stronger point. The only other thing I'll mention in the key takeaways is SMARTS itself is driven by 21 technology areas. Those technology areas are very focused on two technical domains uh, that are that are high in expertise in rad hard microelectronics and hypersonics. Um, those are key critical areas, not only for our customer set that we support via SMARTS, uh, but will be key areas that we will be growing in the future within um, the government ready community around that innovation infrastructure uh, that we have. Um, so with that said, that's the bulk of the, the very centric things that we wanted to cover on SMARTS. So at this point, I will actually turn it over to my peer, Tara, who will discuss the uh, similar centric items um, on the T-Rex vehicle. Tara? Thanks, Brooke, uh, and good afternoon or morning if you're coming from the West Coast, I guess. <laughs> um, I am going to go over a few things with the T-Rex vehicle. Again, um, mo all of what Ian and Janae have covered up to date is true for both um, OTs, and there are some differences between SMARTS and T-REX. Um, before I get into some of the lists, I just, so the SOW is something that I've, I've gotten asked about a lot, and SMARTS is something where the SOW is a part of uh, the solution um, package that you would, uh, you would send in um, for, with your responses. And uh, however, on the T-REX side, the SAO is completed after the uh, government, the acquiring agency makes a selection and, and uh, the milestones are submitted with. So that's the difference, but you still get to collaborate with uh, the government prior to the official award um, with your milestones to uh, make sure that, that they, they meet the intent, they match up with the SAO that's created afterwards and, um, that, and to follow up and collaborate further uh, to refine those to make sure that it's it's what everybody expects moving forward. So there's a little bit of a difference there between SMARTS and T-REX. Uh, so the SOW is uh, created once a company is selected. Um, but I do want to say, that, so with, with T-REX, the, the, it's a very broad scope. So while it's training and readiness accelerator, and I think one of the things that everybody focuses on is the fact that it says training. Um, and that is one of the key areas, especially as it's focused on modeling and simulation. However, warfighter readiness is also um, is also a focus area, and that is a broad, broad area. So as um, I think a lot of folks have seen with uh, some of the RFSs that have come out, especially over this past year, um, it really does encompass that 
that readiness component as well as that training component. Um, and, and because of that, we do have a very strong external customer base. So we, uh, while it's an army uh, sponsored OT, we do have a lot of interest from other areas such as the Navy and, and the Air Force. And other government entities have also been reaching out to the T-Rex, uh, to the T-Rex team. So we we definitely cross a lot of spectrums. So again, PEO Stride owns the vehicle as an Army entity. However, we have a lot of uh, contracts and customers that come from all across the Army and uh, Navy and uh, other government domains. Another key area is the rolling Q and A. We once a draft RFS is, is posted, we can start accepting questions. And I, and I can't stress this enough, the importance of asking a question as soon as you have it. Uh, I, I, I know um, it's, it's been talked about, that's, that's one of the key ways that you can engage with the government is ask your question as soon as you have it. That way you get the answer to the question uh, as soon as possible. So we don't ex we, we're trying to avoid having all the questions come in uh, at the question due date, and then have all these questions get dropped back to industry a week or two later. Uh, the faster your questions can come in, the faster they can get answered, and the faster you can make sure that your solution meets the intent. So I, I highly recommend everybody take advantage of that rolling Q&A. And again, that really starts as soon as the draft RFS is posted. And, and honestly, it really starts with the coming soon notice. If you've got any questions, we're happy to answer them. Uh, and we have answered them in the past. So de definitely take advantage of that. Um, I, and again, you'll have other opportunities to engage with uh, various various customers at various times. And and also, there's summarized feedback is uh, typically provided to each respondent, meaning that uh, if you did not get accepted, you'll have a fairly decent and and extensive response as to why uh, you didn't get ex uh, accepted this time around. And that, those are great because it really helps to hone your uh, writing so that the next time that you submit a solution, you can you can uh, tailor it a little bit further to make sure you're hitting the marks. But again, I think that this uh, walkthrough helps a lot of folks understand what, a, what are some of those key areas in the RFS to take a look at. So, um, and, and we'll be going over uh, some more of that as we as we move through. So again, um, I can't stress enough the engage part uh, Q and A uh, throughout uh, the entire thing. And then if there's a project talks with that happens, you know, definitely definitely ask those questions and those get answered as soon as possible. And if anybody has any questions on on T Rex specifically, I am happy to answer them. And that's that's all I have on T Rex. Well, thank you, Tara, and thank you, Brooke, here for sharing some of the highlights of our two OTA vehicles here. Let's move right along here with our final polling question, and this is a good one. Does participation to a significant extent just mean 50% of the work? Let's see here. Let's look at the choices. A, yes, as evidenced by DOD OTA formulas. B, sure, it could but there are also many other ways to justify significant extent. C, no significance is tied to dollar value, or D, significant extent refers to the extent of significance allotted to a program of record. Let's see where we're polling at here. Okay, I see about 70% coming in with the answer B. And for those of you who answer B, that is correct. Sure, it could, but there are also many other ways to justify significant extent. So great job, you all. Let's move on here to our next slide as we're getting ready to close, that, close up. And this is some of our frequently asked questions. The first two here are questions that we just went over during some of our polling here. Do our subcontractors, teammates need to be members? Well, as many of you uh, previously answered, no, they don't. And also remember that a lot of our subs here can be a part of multiple teams. Our second question here uh, that we frequently receive and we just went over in the polling here, significant extent means 51% of the work, isn't that right? Well, it, it does not simply mean just 50% of the work. 
um, I think the primary focus here is on a performer's contribution to that particular effort of the solution. Hey, Jenny, and if I could just add to that, because this is one that does come up a lot, it, it can include a lot of things. You know, the agreements officer must consider the impact of that technology um, or perhaps that uh, novel process that is reducing time or um, potential cost of that prototype. Bottom line, my, my final test that I always used is that if I were to take that element out of the proposed solution, if I were to remove that algorithm, if I were to remove that, that key expertise, et cetera, would the solution still work? And that's usually the baseline where we can start that conversation of how important something is. It may only be pennies on the dollar in terms of your contract cost or your proposed price, excuse me, but the significance of how much impacts um, obviously has a much higher value than what the numbers may reflect. So keep that in mind. If you were to pull out that person's contribution, would your solution still work? And then folks, please explain that in your proposal. Tell the government why it is significant. Thanks, Janae. Thank you, Ian. That's an excellent explanation there. Let's go on to our third question here. Why do I need to give any details for a firm fixed price proposal? Well, even though we're in a firm fixed price environment on both of these OTAs, the government still has to determine fair and reasonableness. So providing a, whole, a high level allocation of how the funding is gonna be spent through labor and materials and sometimes travel is definitely needed to assist that agreement's offer and determine fair and reasonableness. And the last question here, can I reuse my several white paper? Short answer, no, or it's at least not recommended, okay? Please follow all the instructions of the RFS. They were designed for a purpose. And we definitely are looking for fresh, innovative solutions as we move forward with uh, the RFS. All right, we can go on to the next slide. All right, just a, a couple of key reminders for everybody out there when you're uh, writing a solution for the RFS. Follow the instructions. We cannot stress this enough. Uh, something, if, if something, sim something that seems so simple is often missed uh, and, and it could potentially either disqualify you uh, from being reviewed or it could just really reduce your, your overall rating. And you don't really want to have something um, that, sh that should have been easily covered be the reason that um, you might fall short from getting, from getting it. So follow the instructions. That is our, that's our, our number one <laughs> focus for this one. Um, and also take advantage of the opportunities to engage throughout the entire RFS cycle. Whether it's Smarts or T-Rex, there's a lot of different ways that the uh, customers uh, offer to engage. We offer ways to engage and the customers are anxious to hear from you. So definitely don't be afraid to ask your questions, uh, whether it's through the regular question cycle, a project talks, an industry day, a demo day, um, th those often help to set the stage or uh, refine the requirement or um, within the RFS. So also data rights, that's, you know, make sure you understand what they're asking for in the data rights. Ian had talked about this earlier and we can't stress that enough either. That, that's always a contentious point because you're, what, people aren't really sure what they mean or what they're gonna use the, the rights for, ask the question, ask the question as early as you can. Uh, that way you can get a better understanding of what they're trying to do with the data rights that are being requested. Also the security component, definitely make sure you understand that and understand what they're trying to do with it. Again, ask the questions. And as Janae just covered and, and Ian, with the non-traditional requirement, it, it, is, it is a very big component of this. Uh, so if you're not a non-traditional company that says the prime and you need to, you need to better understand how that non-traditional component works, and we're happy to walk you through that as well um, later if, if you would like some additional information on that piece. But essentially what Ian said is spot on. The significant contribution can mean without it, it doesn't work without that piece, whether it's a small piece or a large piece, the system doesn't work without it. And it's really up to the team to describe why that's the case. So we really, the, the big takeaways here too, our OTAs are about innovative solutions. 
um, you know, th think think non those not those non traditional uh, keywords. A lot of times you're going to see them within the RFS. What they're looking for um, and why and why what they're looking for is innovative. It's it's going to be a descriptive requirement rather than a prescriptive requirement. A lot of times I know I've heard where folks are like, well, they're just not giving me that much. Well, that's the idea. Um, you know, in, in the far based world, we're saying they give us too much detail and they're they're kind of making taking that innovation component away. Whereas here they're being descriptive so that they can get that true innovative ideas from, from industry. So, and uh, next slide. Thanks Tara for that. This is Hannah with um, um, membership and marketing. Uh, just want to power through this real quick, uh, the submission process. Um, spend a few minutes on this. Uh, you can submit solutions very easily directly through our website. Um, you can do this by going to the opportunity you want to submit a solution on and press the button that says submit a solution. Uh, just note that any user affiliated with your company can submit a solution and you can have an unlimited, uh, an unlimited amount of users um, affiliated with your company. Uh, we ask that when you go to submit a solution that you have uh, all the documents that you wish to submit your cage code handy, and that you take a few minutes at the end to let us know a little bit more about your solution. We have two survey questions that we'd love for you to fill out, uh, and we love your feedback. Um, one of the concerns is whether or not your submission went through. We've created a solution for that. You can send yourself and your colleagues a receipt at the very end, right before you submit your solution. Um, so type in all the emails that you want to receive a receipt. And when you submit your solution, everybody will get those emails. Uh, a few takeaways. Uh, you must be logged into your account in order to submit a solution. And if you want to change the information, uh, specifically in the information about your proposed prime contractor section, make sure that you check the edit information box. This will allow you to unlock that grayed out area and make the necessary changes that you need. Once those changes are made, then you can select the verified checkbox and move on with your application. Uh, that's all from me, so we can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Hannah. I know Hannah is doing the draw, so just uh, bear with us for another minute before we end. But I wanted to thank our NSTXL experts. It was a great, great uh, session. Uh, so we do have one more summer event series coming up. Um, so make sure that you register for the prototype execution on August 5th, where we'll review the statement of work and milestone collaboration to milestone execution. Our NSTXL experts will discuss what selected vendors should anticipate once they become project performers. And also, we are starting um, our cybersecurity webinar series, um, and that will be on July 21st. This will be a three-part series where, uh, where we'll outline cyber threats that could impact your organization and clarify how to resolve your issues today, all while preparing the next steps to your National Institute Standards and Technology and NIST compliance. All right, on to the next slide. All right, you can, um, we are running out of time, so we won't be able to answer all the questions right now, but be sure that we are going to answer the questions and we'll be sending it along with the presentation um, in, this week. So please be uh, on the lookout if you have a question or feel free to email us and we'll forward the questions on at membership at nstxl.org. And Hannah, do you have the winner's names? I sure do. And I just got word that uh, all the answers should be emailed within the next 48 hours. Um, so look, at, look for that guys. And then uh, moving on to the winners. So for the two hydro flasks, uh, the first winner is Tracy Sanchez. Uh, the second winner is Chad Cravens. Sorry if I'm messing up anybody's name, I apologize. And then the Kindle white paper winner is Kevin Vizari. Again, I apologize if I messed up your name. Um, please let me know how to pronounce it. Uh, and feel free to email us at membership at nstxl.org with your information so we can get all of that sent to you. Um, thank you again. And, and Sophie, that's all for me. All right, everyone. Don't forget to complete the survey 
um, at the end of this, and you will be seeing an email from us with all the information and the recording of the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.